we go. We are now live. No, oh, no. I know. Hey, everybody. How's it going, everyone? The dy dynamic duo are finally together for a live stream. About damn time. Yes. <laughs> so, um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I know today I wanted to talk a little bit about leadership and tactics and some of the philosophies that we kind of read and follow and how that can uh, help improve your unit, your impression, your military experience in reenacting. Yep. And then um, we'll answer your questions uh, and your comments as they come in. So um, we're, uh, we're drinking Moxie. Um, because we're a Maine unit, and this is a, a big deal in the state of Maine, apparently. We think it tastes kind of weird, but it is slowly growing on us. Yeah, I'm not gagging mm -hmm. with the aftertaste much anymore, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of nice. So, um, yeah, when it comes, I don't know, I think how, how effective you are as a unit, um, I think, and also, too, how how good your experience is with reenacting really comes down to a lot of how your organization, how your company is run. Yep. Um, in addition to the relationships that you have, but it's the, the clarity of expectations and the quality of training that you have that allows everyone to have a better experience and people feel more comfortable and confident when they know what's expected of them. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, get you across here, sorry. The captain um, really took on the, the the paperwork side of things with writing out um, all of our company officer and NCO expectations, yeah. uh, which we have uh, on our homepage yep. at secondusss.com. If you want to check them out, then maybe they could give you some useful information and kind of guide your own journey. And, um, and so that was a really good starting point. So a lot of those are taken from um, mil period military expectations, which you're going to find in your customs of service manuals. You're also going to find them in other um, manuals of the time. You know, even Casey's talks about some of that stuff. <laughs> and, um, but then we also draw a lot from uh, modern military uh, philosophy. Yeah. And... Um, uh, Grandpa definitely helps with that a lot. Yeah, um, and so, and, and because of that connection, we've drawn a lot of stuff from uh, the Marine Corps, <clears throat> who've really done a lot of fantastic work with sort of outlining um, character traits, uh, leadership philosophy. There's also some really good measurements for um, kind of like judging your proficiency, because proficiency is really important, yeah. whether you're a private or you're a high-ranking officer, field staff. Um, so you should know what you're supposed to do. And um, the other thing we'll get into a little bit later is, you know, always working on your impression and always working on your yeah your, your, your unit history. Oh, um, God, yeah. You got to expand beyond Ken Burns. Um, <laughs> and glory. <laughs> yes, and glory, gods and generals. Um, I mean. Yeah, you should be reading diaries, personal accounts that actually know what's going on in your unit, um, their culture, the places they're from, and because that's going to help help you immerse yourself um, in the experience. And what's really key, and you don't really learn early on, no one really goes out of their way to tell you, is the more you learn about the local history and the culture um, of your unit, the more everything you learn in the hobby makes sense. Yeah. Um, knowing like the, the history of the tactical manuals, why they do it in that way all makes sense. Oh, God. And then when we get to talking tactics on the battlefield, um, <clears throat> you may not think it at mainstreamer events, but um, <laughs> civil war battles were incredibly dynamic yeah. um, and adaptive, highly responsive, the changes on the battlefield. And far longer ranges than 75 feet. Oh, yes. And far, <laughs> far longer ranges than the safety distance. And and so if you can take all that knowledge and put it together, then you can get some really dynamic reenacting experiences. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things. It just all builds on itself. <clears throat> hey, we got a lot of comments. Okay, comments. 
Let's see. So, hello to Nebraska, first and, off. Yeah. Hello to Florida, Nevada. Uh, Indiana, from what it seems like. Uh, no, we don't We don't get out to Indiana. <laughs> hey, Turnham. <laughs> And then, uh, like a place to find a good drum, get in touch with Kelly Ford on Facebook. That'll steer you in the right direction. Anyone, wait. Hey, uh, what's going on, Daniel? Anyone who knows that will learn that women and children existed in the 1860s. They did? Yeah, what? I no thought way. it was just military. I thought yeah. we just lived in a military state. I thought it was just a bunch of <laughs> small <some> dicks. <laughs> um... Yeah, so like that, th th this is the other thing too that I feel like even a lot of authentics totally miss is that soldiers um, were civilians before the war, yeah. and so they all had um, trade, um, education backgrounds, different levels of social class, different different cultures, different languages spoken. It was a citizen army. Yeah, and so you have that huge breadth of diversity that's going to um, guide and influence your impression. Uh, and also, um, you know, the impact of the soldiers having families and being away uh, from home for the very first time, most of them. Uh, da, 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 da. Do you guys have an archivist, someone who tracks the history of your unit, battalion, someone who takes pictures? Um, kind of everyone. Yeah, anyway. yeah. So, David, do you, are you talking about like uh, like a reenacting history, or are you talking about like collecting actual history? Uh, because we do we do both. We have, gosh, like. Five six hundred pages of original company D yeah. um, stuff, and um, several of us are actually working on transcribing uh, those letters and those after action reports um, into like a giant comprehensive company D uh, website or s spreadsheet. So that way we know what was going on, who was saying what to whom. Uh, but as far as like modern reenacting archiving. That's just kind of our website, and I, I do the web page management for that. <clears throat> Why does it look like you're in a mafia kill room? Because we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm one white lab coat away from being Shh. Patrick Bateman. Mm. Now you're talking. Yeah. How heavy was the biggest gun? Uh, those are going to be, what, your Columbia ads? Yeah. Generally for fortifications, and then the rail guns are just going to be absurd. You just have to look that up. Yeah. A good source for infantry drill manuals on tactics. Uh, Casey's. That's always the standby. Yeah, especially if you're Union. Um, but also, if you could find the 1863 infantry tactics book. It's mm -hmm. about that big, but it's about that thick. Grab it if you can. Yeah, um, and also I highly recommend um, picking up some post-war manuals. They're all on like Google. Yep. Um, the the post-war manuals kind of they, they take everything that was learned and used in the Civil War, and I find that the post-war ones can be a lot more descriptive and explanatory. Yeah. Um, you just need to be pretty pretty proficient in your um, wartime manuals, so that way you don't confuse yourself with post-war tactics and drill that changed slightly. Some, a lot of it stayed the same, but there were a few key uh, tactical changes, some vocabulary changed. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah, and then uh, Silas Tackett's website it has a huge archive of all sorts of manuals for just about everything you can think of. So it's like Silas Tackett at ZipCon. If you Googled that, you'd find it. Um, hey, first Minnesota. Happy New Year, man. Okay, I agree. A lot of people don't build up their back first person or have a backstory to their character. I portray my great uncle who was in the second U.S. Sharpshooters. Do you work on canal boats? Um, n no. Uh, we're we're mainers. Uh, we're um, farmers. Lumbermen, sailors, um, a lot of ship rides, some mechanics. Yep. McClure was Stone in, workers. Yeah, I think uh, McClure sold harvesting equipment, had a photographer, pharmacist, um, wide diversity of trades. Uh, oh, okay. It worked on canal boats. Well, that's... that's Hell yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And uh, Red, yes, I do remember you, man. 
How's it going? Let's see, okay. kind of like a unit secretary. Do you have guys designated as a scribe, squad leaders? What roles besides captain and CO are there in reenacting world? <laughs> Which one of those do you use? So we use a lot. We have a, a company quartermaster. Yeah. Takes care of all the spare uniforms, equipment for new guys. Uh, one of our corporals is the company clerk. Um, so paperwork, stuff like that usually gets filled out by our company clerk, mm -hmm. which is Corporal Hardway, and then I'm usually the second one to sign it. Um, we have our ordnance yeah. master, so company uh, ammo kit. Yeah, ammo, uh, yeah, clean. ammo storage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so we have, <laughs> everyone who's in charge of a job has paperwork, because the Civil War is, I mean, officers complain constantly about the massive paperwork burden. Yeah. And when we were at the main archives, we really got a, a real sense of that because Maine kept um, the best records of any state in the north. Um, also, probably because they sent the most soldiers. Works calling me. I got to okay. uh, take it real quick. Uh, sent the most soldiers uh, to the war. So there was a lot of paperwork there. Um, yeah, we take a lot of pride. Um, there is a, a manual called the Company Clerk. You can find reprints of it. It's also on uh, Google Library for free. It's a pretty good read. You'll find a lot of, um, uh, you'll find the forms in there uh, if you want to fill out those forms and recreate those. You can also, uh, what is it, uh, the 1861 uh, regulations. Um, hey, Private Turnin. Um, it's that blue book. Could you write down the, the title of that book, um, 1861 Regulations? It's that one, like, it's like this thick. Um, that that has even more forms in there that would be a good reference. Um, most, yeah, so, and we, we kind of annoy battalion because we try to do paperwork, right? There's a lot more we can do, but just the, the pack schedule our organization keeps us on, it, it pulls us away from a lot of the uh, regular um, impression stuff, the the day-to-day the -day minutia of mundane paperwork. Um, let's see. Um, just catching up. Uh, what is your opinion on Sharps carbines? Um, I don't know. Um, do you know you did you know that they make them in full size? Uh, I think when you shoot a three band, um, carbines are are neat, but uh, to enjoy the the full benefit and technology of a sharps rifle, um, 1859 three band is the way to go. Yeah, I've never been a big fan of carbines, but there's a place for them. Um, and also too, I mean, the army didn't get much use out of them either because they went they decided to ditch those and go with the trap door. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Uh, this, I'm just kind of showing you where I'm at. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. So, private training uh, has got us covered on the on the great paperwork book, revised regulations for the Army of the United States, 1861. Yes, that is a good. You one. can get that on Amazon. It it actually has regulations. So if yeah. you have people trying to tell you, it's like, oh, it was this way. It's like, no, it's 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 an easy read. Granted, those soldiers are, you know, creatures of comfort and habit. So they'll they'll find ways to skirt the regulation. Well, especially or, being actors. <laughs> or they'll just break regulation yeah. altogether. It happened, especially with the sharpshooters. Yeah. Um, burr, burr, burr. Uh, what sort of immersive events do you attend and or host? Well, we're getting into, well, we've been kind of doing more of our own. Uh, we have an event site that we work with. Um, our organization, uh, I would say, the uh, my personal opinion is our, the biggest um, problem with our organization is that it caters, I think, too heavily to the, the mainstreamers, FARBs, and they have this strange obsession with being dinner theater for the public. Yeah. Um, and they think that those little people that... Um, fuel the hobby, they, they keep it going, when in fact it's in our area, the mainstream units are just dropping numbers. Um, there's like, what, three or four 
that, progressives that yeah, are well, really getting up there. Well, the mainstreaming, it's like there's oh, the three or four yeah. units that can't pull numbers. Yeah, there are always, you know, six, seven guys, but, you know, there's always, you know, off two offs or at least yeah. one, maybe two NCOs and, like, one private. Yeah, and so consistently the three biggest units on the Union side are either progressive or authentic. So yeah. if we can get some alignment, we, we could, you know, have some more immersive events out here in the Northwest. Uh, but there is more and more of us um, talking and having conversations about doing our own just to just to have a better time and get more out of the hobby. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ooh, that's a good one. How do promotions work? So I'll, I'll take that one. I love I love the promotion questions. So promotions and reenacting is kind of one of those weird You'll ask a hundred different reenactors how they promote in their unit, and you'll probably get a different answer almost every single time. Trial by combat. <laughs> I mean, that would be awesome. I would love that. But uh, so most units, it's kind of a popularity contest. They'll have a vote, and usually it's, you know, it's just like normal politics. Whoever kind of, you know, strokes the most people and like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, we'll do this, we'll do this, or whoever's popular makes the most noise usually gets the promotion. Um, some promote off uh, how long people have been reenacting for. So, you know, you could have some guy who's been reenacting 20 years and he'll be captain, first sergeant, something yeah. like that. Issue with that that I have is you have some person who knows knows their shit. Mm -hmm. They've been reenacting for two years, but they won't get a promotion because, oh, you haven't been in long enough. But then you get this guy who doesn't know anything, but he's been in forever. Yeah. Stuff like that. So that that's not a fun one. Um for us, we promote off, you know, knowledge of sharpshooter history, drill. Do you have most of your gear? Yeah, completeness is, is really key because having having rank being promoted sets you as a role model. Yep. So you need you need to set that uh, with the, with your impression and your self sufficiency. Yeah, and honestly, I feel like that's probably the best way to promote, especially like within our unit, because. I mean, everyone knows, and we help everyone in our unit to get further and know more. But then there's the people that kind of just do the little bit of extra work, mm -hmm. and they really, really work their asses off to have that rank. And, I mean, it, you know, most reenacting units, it's kind of given rank. But, like, we kind of make people earn it. You know, even though it is fake army, it's play, stuff like that, you know, we're still dealing with live gunpowder. Mm-hmm. Horses running around like people can get injured. We're 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 so still we, ultimately so we're dealing with people. Yeah. So knowing how to work with people, and and learning your way up through the rank makes a big difference in how well everyone gets along. Yeah. Um, I would say hunger is is a big thing. Like you have yeah. to really want it. Um, and it's not like oh I just want to I just want to be you know an NCO at I want to be the big boss man. Yeah, I just want to do it. And I, my only participation is the battle events, right? Yeah. Um, it's like no, like you, you need to be hungry, like you need to be doing research and sharing stuff and learning how to to make things or contribute to the unit or to the yep. hobby in general. Like how um, how how are you making the unit better? Because you have stripes or bar. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the higher you go, the more those sleeves start to weigh down or those <laughs> shoulders start to weigh down. It's just like, yeah. all right, is it ever going to end? It's like, no, no, do not take a position unless you are ready to just have your ass handed to you at times, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you don't get a ticket. I mean, just about everyone we've promoted, like, I'll, at least half a dozen times, like, seriously, look them in the face and ask, why? <laughs> like... Why, Why do you want to do this? Like, um, and because you don't really get the luxury of a break, yeah. um, and especially if you are new to that promotion and new to leadership, you're going to overwork yourself uh, yep. due to inexperience and eagerness to please, and so you're going to have a big learning curve with delegation. Yeah, and. Um, Making sure that um, not only delegating, but making sure that you you know you, you never ask someone to do something you don't know how to do, right? or wouldn't do yourself, or wouldn't do yourself. It doesn't mean you're like the master of that thing, but you are familiar enough with it to perform that duty. Yeah. Um, and and that also means in order for you to delegate and still be successful as a leader, 
then you would have had to have trained and educated those uh, in your squad or company. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see here. <laughs> um, we do have a promotion ceremony. We have uh, photos of one of them at on our website at secondusss.com. It was uh, Battle of Chini. So if you scroll down the homepage a little ways, you'll find the, the pictures. All white gloves, sashes. We have Captain Whitehall does all the uh, warrants. Yep. That's a lot of fun. I love writing those things out. Uh, Jonathan. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, so two questions. Where can I find a copy of Fatigue Purposes by Pat Brown, and do you have any other good books on federal enlisted uniforms? Um, the first one, I'm not entirely sure. I've also been looking for that book, and it's extremely hard to find. It's one of those out of print. Uh, so, uh, okay. You need an act of Congress just yeah. to find an eBay link. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have two books. I don't know the names. Oh, wait, they're right there. So Yeah, the captain's the uniform guy. Yeah, I. Here, let me just grab these books real quick. If you want to know way too much information about tent stakes, I'm your man. So, <laughs> this one is yours. I need to return this to you. Is it? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Man. I saw it last time I was over on the coast. Really? Yeah. I'll be darned. So, uh, this one, American Equipage, 1851 to 1872. This book has everything in it. So, you know, you got rank, Signal Corps. Um, a little brief history, a lot of write-ups, uh, manufacturers, things like that. Knapsacks, haversacks, canteens, rifles. It's it's a solid book. Um, you know, some kind of eh drawings. Yeah. But, I mean, this book was printed, I think, in like the 60s or 70s. Um, but yeah, flags even are in this. Yeah. It's incredible. I, I, would, I would say... Um... Jonathan, uh, spend the 90 bucks and get the 1861 Quartermaster Manual. Yeah, You also have all the official plates of the different uni uniform varieties in the back. So you can actually see a studio photograph of that uniform combination. They talk about weights, types of thread. Like I didn't know like alpaca was an inventory, apparently. Yeah. So um, it, it has like all the military requirements... Uh, listed in there, and for that purpose, I would highly recommend uh, that one. Yep. And then the other one is Army Blue, the uniform of Uncle Sam's regulars, 1848 to 1873. So it covers a broad period, a very broad period. Um, color photos, really sourceful. Mm -hmm. There's some really good close-up pictures of um, stitching, on, like overcoats and stuff, because I guess <laughs> they use some weird little, uh, like oh, yeah. stitching even. Yeah, it and, makes a difference. Yeah, so yeah, these two books, yeah, cannot suggest them enough. Mm. Oh, and the other thing too is like, you know, keep your eye out on eBay because some like the the value of uh, Civil War stuff really kind of goes up and comes down uh, pretty severely. And if you're looking for like an original piece, look for like a beat up one, like something that would not cut. Most collectors' um, first choice. Yeah, and so you can get like original knapsacks and frock coats, sack coats, uh, for um, sometimes as much as a high quality new one. Yeah, um, you just you know set those eBay reminders. Um, tips on pushing authenticity in a group. Want me to take that one because that was sure. kind of the the movement. So, <clears throat> authenticity in a group is. Well, pardon the expression, but you're going to get a lot of shit. A lot. Um, we used to be one of those Farby Burdan units. It was all green, green canteen covers, green vests, leggings all the time, things like that. Settler Row. Yeah, Settler Row. That's the best way to put it. Um, and I was kind of the first one to really get a Wombo Fatigue blouse in the company. Right around the time this guy joined. And it was one of those things where, you know, it's like, why would you spend that money on that when you can buy an $80 one? Like, and when well, you're the only one. Yeah. Like, you, you're the first one. Yeah. You are the weird one. Yeah. So, like, you kind of set the standard. You know, you start doing research and you share it with people. That's, to change a unit like that, that's what you have to do. You have to start, like, hey, did you know, like, so-and-so wrote this and this and this and this and this and this and this that this was done? It's like, oh, okay. And sometimes people will just kind of laugh it off or shrug it off. But, you know, people start to notice. Uh, this guy noticed. Yeah. I think what? After I think it was like a year or two after I got my blouse. 
Yeah, it, starting to rock. Well, it was, yeah, it was one of those things that. Um, well, it was the being promoted was a big thing because I, 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 I felt like I I gotta step it up. But when I started out, I didn't know like who to talk to. Like, is this a thing? Like, where do I get stuff? It was still kind of a, a, a foreign world to move in that direction, and um, Ethan really kind of took the first steps for the unit, and then it just became. Uh, an infection and yeah. we all realized like wow you look so much better as a unit authentic than everybody else on the field the the gear lasts longer um it looks better for all you mainstreamers like wearing the sutler row uniforms if you go authentic with your uniform the wool is lighter it's breathable the uniforms are comfortable yeah um they're longer lasting they have yes. a lot more movement in yeah and you know the cost is up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely, but shop around. People getting out of the hobby, mm -hmm. changing, you know, people grow out of their clothes. There's a lot of young guys that get authentic stuff. Two years, you know, they're get it when they're 15. Well, by the time they're 17, 18, you know, growth spurts, mm -hmm. they're selling their stuff for cheap. Yeah, and then also, too, um, Ethan's done videos on sewing um, fatigue blouses. So you can get a kit and save a lot of money. Yep. Um and then just set a priority. Like I, I feel like people get obsessed, like thinking I, I want to go the authentic route. When you just like, well, what can I do to defarb completely, mainstream or otherwise? And then how can I be self sufficient, right? So really think about how complete your gear is where it's at. Because you can have like a fantastic uniform, but if you're still in the motor home. I mean, it's all for naught. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So kind of set priorities and you can always ask us questions. Let's see here. I saw. Uh, so, David, um, with your uh, asking about scanning books and collection and all that, shoot me an email. Um, it's at secondusss.com. It's on our homepage. Yeah. Uh, shoot me an email and uh, we can definitely talk more and see if I can set you up right. I saw one. Oh, and also, David, uh, Sutler Row is basically where all the Sutler tents are that kind of just sell the generic reenactment. Pakistani stuff. Yeah, you know, the, the starter kit, I guess. Yeah, I guess so it depends on where you are. Because, I mean, if you're, like, some back east events, you're going to have, like, the good Sutlers. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, the, the Sutlers today are as much of a curse uh, as far as quality goes as it was in the 1860s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, and then, yeah, just ask, ask lots of questions. Uh, once you start getting the authentic gear, you will be hooked, um, and the buyer's remorse will just disappear instantly. It'll hurt pain up front, but when you get it, it's like, wow, why did I ever wear this junk, other junk before? Cry once. Yep. Uh, there was one question. Uh, Matt uh, De Loretto, out of curiosity, are there any reenactors in your unit that would be able to qualify with the marksman tests used initially for the sharpshooters? Yeah. There's a few. I don't like my rear sights. Like, I have whatever run of Pedersoli I have, I don't have the right sights that they had during the war. Um, and I, I can I can walk it in, but it's it's a big process. If I had better sights, if I had, like, yours or turn-in sights, you know my, my weird half moon. Yeah, yeah, yours is like a buckhorn without the notch for the front sight. Like, yeah. I mean... All you need is a file, you know. <laughs> I know you have like one or two yeah. just laying around. <clears throat> yeah. You can easily just, you know. Well, and we want to do more live fire um, events as a unit. Uh, we always try to make sure it's always a big moment for uh, a reenactor. And they, they saved up their money for their sharps rifle and they finally get a chance to, to put a real bullet in it. Um, it's just, a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but we, we, uh, we've had a lot of burn bands that kind of like cut our summer short. And, you know, not this last year, but the year before, we even had a shooting ban. Yeah. Um, so we didn't start any forest fires. Especially so. where I live in eastern Washington. Yeah, you couldn't even... You could hunt. That was the only thing. You could hunt yeah. um, to shoot. But targets, anything like that, like even gun ranges were closed. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, you go to like an indoor pistol range. But yeah. That's a completely different animal. Uh, da -da -da. Oh, yeah. Sell a rose for farts and farts. <laughs> I mean, farts work too. Uh, you're not far off, Gaslight. Uh. Can you do a video on 
how to do the officer of the day sash uh, wrap. Oh, okay. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I saw your comment on that video. I I've already been planning that one. So once we can get together, um, us yeah. again and yeah, we'll easily do one for you. Um, okay. There are some decent West coast sellers though. There are, they're decent. They're not terrible. Like, uh, James's uniform. Mill Creek. Yeah. yeah that yeah, was... Some of our stuff's and eh, but her like sharpshooter stuff is actually the right kind of green. Yeah, it's just heavy. Yeah, heavy education gold. goes a long way because yeah. you can find gold and an otherwise mediocre sutler. Yeah, um, and even like sutlers that have bad reputations, they might be known for one like solid item. Um, so I think those of you who are in the hobby, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. So. <sighs> Most authentic guys these days avoid almost any company with Sutler in the name. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, let, let's move into the leadership a little bit. So, okay. so the, the first thing that Ethan came to us with were the leadership principles. So what are our, what are our guiding values that we're looking for? Yeah, so those of you guys with prior military experience, um, especially those in the Marine Corps are probably familiar with the phrase JJ did tie buckle. Yeah, I know. It's an awesome acronym, isn't it? So what that is, is the 14 traits of leadership. So the 14 traits, and we'll break these down as we go, but I'll read them all off first. So there's dependability, bearing, courage, decisiveness, endurance, enthusiasm, initiative, integrity, judgment, justice, Knowledge, tact, unselfishness, and loyalty. Um, I mean, that kind of encompasses a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And everyone can get a different, um, you know, they can draw something out of it. But for a good leader, even in reenacting from a corporal to a battalion commander, really, um, they need to at least have some of these traits. Or not some. They have to have knowledge in all of these traits to rephrase that because you know you could be really strong in one area but be terrible in the other you know you could you know hey you know follow me over the top kind of mentality but if you have poor tact you know you're not going to have anyone to follow you they're like yeah yeah sure you go over the top you know or you can lead them over the top and not know what to do when you get there and everything your whole crew dies yeah you can't lead them once you're there yeah so. you're failing at your knowledge <laughs> so uh, dependability uh, reenacting um those of you especially if you have leadership you got to make every event, Bar barring, you know, like medical issues, family, you know, stuff like that, common sense stuff. But um, the, the more the more frequent your attendance is, um, even going to all the extra stuff, yeah, um, that is going to really make you a, a more of a key player. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those, you know, hey, I need someone to do something, you know, if you're one of those dependable guys, it's like, yeah, you, mm -hmm. like, come on, plus kind of helps if you want to get promoted if you're insane enough <laughs> yeah like yeah i mean people coming like driving all night to make the last battle on the second day i mean that, uh, that corporal sodder <laughs> yeah that is commitment yeah like uh rolling in like four in the morning and sleeping in your car for an hour and a half yep um, or uh, riding a motorcycle across state yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's true um bearing so those who don't know bearing it's not you know we're, our bearing is this way. No, we're not a ship. You know, we're not using a compass. Bearing is how you conduct yourself. It's one of those uh, morning parade. Let's use that as a great example. So morning parade, you know, you're supposed to be very formal. It's eyes front, you know, you're at parade rest, which is standing at attention. Well, the issue with that is the horse farts. <laughs> Little kid runs through the formation. Someone drops a rifle, and everyone's... No, 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 no. That. The number one thing at parade. Oh. The battalion commander and or adjutant skips a command or flubs a command. Yeah. And everyone's shoulder arms, right shoulder, you know, just shouting out, keep your mouth shut. But that's one portion of bearing. The other is not getting mad on the field. Like, legitimately mad. Instead of, like, you know, ah, move up your line, you know, theater kind of thing. But, like, genuinely, like, getting in someone's face and chewing them out over something small. Instead of, like, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's let's talk about, like, what happened. Yeah. Something like that. Keeping your cool. 
That's a big one. But that also goes for, say, you're getting flanked on the field. It's an oh shit moment. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> it's happened to us, and we've done it plenty of times. And you see the face. And it's one of those things of, hey, okay, you need to back it up. See, Yeah, bearing is discipline, which... I mean, and discipline honestly should be also on here, but you know, well, yeah, and it's also to like you know maintain like your military demeanor that too during during business hours essentially. Yep. If you're doing mainstream, if you're authentic, you know, you pretty much always got to be in the zone. Yeah, um, I like courage. Yeah, a mental quality that recognizes fear of danger or criticism, but enables a man to proceed in the face of it with calmness and firmness. Um, Nut up or shut up. <laughs> that's that's the easiest way to put it. Um, I would say for for reenacting, um, courage can just be a lot about like engaging the public. Yeah. Um, trying something new, asking questions, um, having asking someone to show you how to do something, having the courage to say, "I don't know this," especially when you're surrounded by people that you respect. Yeah, um, that is a big one. Yeah, so you know we don't know what you don't know all the time, and we can see by your results um, as leaders. But unless you ask, we can't we can't pinpoint uh, train you into what you you actually want. Um, cur- courage to push yourself. Yeah. Um, there's you know you can be a little you know you see a lot of mainstreamers they just you know they just have their rifle and their cartridge box and they're good. Um, are you going to have the courage to strap on a loaded pack and carry everything with you and it's 95 degrees outside? And you just ate a chocolate cream pie. <laughs> yes. um, but you, you, then, you, then you have like the courage to just like power through. Like you, yeah. you have committed to this. You're going to do it. Um, yeah. And yeah, and the courage to stand up for yourself too. Um, I know some of you might be unfortunately in units where you have jerks. Um, who, who like to boss people around and talk loud and act like they know everything? Um, you know, have the courage to tell them to like keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. Uh, the other one is uh, decisiveness. Again, it's one of those broad subjects. You know, it could be in camp instead of you know, you know, someone comes up to first sergeant, hey, you know, where do we need the fire pit? Uh, 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 I, uh, I guess <laughs> it can go over there. Or it's like, no, fire pit is going to go there. I need it this feet by this feet to get this deep. Six feet from the canvas. That's all I care about. Yeah. <laughs> but that's also on the field. Instead of, you know, I'm trying to think of a situation here. Well, it'll be like, uh, here, here's some, well, um, I, I would say alignment. Yeah. Is a decisive thing that's common, right? Yeah. You're either too far uh, ahead or too far back. What do you do? Are you just going to, like, freeze and stand there? Because if you're too far ahead, then you just, like, kill the fighting effectiveness of your unit because they can't shoot because you're too far ahead. Or your upper command dies. Dies. <laughs> I go down. We need to do that this First year. First goes down. Yeah, we need to do that more this year. Is that corporal going to look around and go, oh, no, they're dead. What do I do? Or are they going to be like, hey, you know, skipper and uh, first sergeant are down. Let's go. You know, they just pick up that command and just run with it, or are they going to freeze? And uh, yeah, David, you're absolutely right. Decisiveness is hard to describe because it really encompasses so many things, mm-hmm. and it's hard to really kind of <clears throat> wrap your brain around. Because yeah. it can go from the smallest thing, like, okay, am I going to pack my cartridge box, or am I going to go cook my food first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, no, like, uh, it's like, am I going to go, like, go to the dance and clean my rifle in the middle of the night or, you know, stuff like that. That example also kind of goes into judgment a little bit. Yeah, it does. And we got a little ways to go before we get to judge you. Okay, uh, endurance. The mental and physical stamina measured by the ability to withstand pain, fatigue, stress, and hardship. (laughs) Challenge yourself. I mean, reenacting is about getting us out of modernity. So just just doing the minimal at a reenactment gives you a sense of how much tougher these people were. Um, and the pain is kind of goes with it. Um, but also too, you should you should push yourself. Like yeah. don't don't let the first time like you get off the couch be an event. Like um, when we do uh, bivouac, I'll make sure that I get like, you know, my Back and neck will get tired from the marching. Yeah, um, and yeah. I'll just get I'll just get worn out up here, and I'll get a migraine. So, for a week or two beforehand, um, 
you know, before after dinner, I'm marching my property with, you know, 28 pound knapsack, you know, for half hour, an hour uh, to get myself into shape. Um, and same too, like, if you have to get your feet used to your brogans. Um, and then just having, you know, being pushing yourself, like just because you're a little hot doesn't mean you can't power through. Doesn't mean you yeah. can't split a little bit more wood. Um, doesn't mean you can't um, last to the end of the battle. Yep. So um, don't be afraid to safely push yourself um, yeah. to try more, learn more, and uh, you do need some physical level of fitness for reenacting what you do and how you do it. But you know, always try to take it up a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, a big part too of that, you know, endurance goes for NCOs and officers for a very big part because. After a march or a battle, you know, you just want to kick your feet up, take off your coat, and relax. Well, that's great. But you have the people, bugle calls. You have your people. <laughs> don't get me started on that. But, you know, you have people still under you. Yes, again, it's play army. But you still have privates to take care of. You know, you need to make sure that your privates are taken care of, and then you take care of yourself. You have to endure that little bit more of heat, that little bit more of discomfort to make sure that your people are taken care of. And then you can relax. So yeah, you have to endure mm -hmm. a little bit more discomfort and pain. Yeah, and it sucks. Oh, it, you and I both know <laughs> it sucks, especially our first season together as first sergeant captain. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of heavy lifting during that that transition. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, because like, yeah, for me, it's uh, I gotta get back. I gotta I gotta do a quick meeting uh, with my NCOs if anything has changed since you know our previous conversation to make sure that my junior NCOs can each take care of their squads. Um, and that our, uh, our, sorry, our other sergeant can, um, kind of keep a, keep a handle on things, yep. uh, while I end up doing, you know, more, more business end of stuff. The mundane. Yes. So, uh, next one, enthusiasm. <clears throat> the display of sincere interest, exuberance in the performance of duty. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Like, I mean, yeah, obviously if you're going to be on canteen detail, fatigue detail, guard mount, it sucks. I mean... There's a reason why people to this day complain about fatigue <laughs> duty. It sucks. It's part of the experience, though. But at the same time, just smile. I mean, it's kind of the, the yes massa mentality. Yeah, you don't have to... Yeah, I mean, have a positive attitude about everything that you're doing and find find hope. In, a, in an ideal situation, you're not being asked to do anything that's beneath you or doesn't contribute to the good of everybody. So take pride in the opportunity to do a, a job well done and give it your best effort. And then the, the faster and more proficiently that you can provide, you know, you can complete that task, is then you can relax more. You'll appreciate this one. To crow, Ron Swanson. Don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. Exactly. You know, go at it, just guns blazing, even if it's to fill up canteens. You know, hey, this is going to be the best canteen fill ever. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I it's mundane, right? You <clears throat> that, but you know, be like, hey, you know, hey, I'm gonna go do canteens, okay? You know, we'll have them back in like five minutes. Yeah. You know, sh show that you want to do it, even if you don't really want to do it. Yeah, and good attitude is um, good and bad attitudes are both infectious. Yeah. So if you don't have the enthusiasm for an event or whatever, don't go and ruin everyone else's time. Um, Put your whole, put your whole and best self into every endeavor, and then you and everyone else around you will have a better time and better results from the experience. Absolutely. Oh, Not initiative! Sure. That's my favorite. Taking action in the absence of orders. <laughs> we, we're getting our unit's pretty good with this now. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there were some teething problems <laughs> here and there, and every now and then, you know, a little bit of a hiccup. Hey, for but... sergeant. Hey, for sergeant. Captain, for sergeant, corporal, 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 for sergeant. It's like, I swear to God, if I hear my rank one more time, rank, one more time, I'm going to yeah, choke you out with a cordless phone. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, again, if you're interested in leadership or just being like a huge asset, someone who's well-liked and, and a key player of your unit, have initiative. You don't. You don't have to wait to be ordered or commanded or asked to do something to do something that you think needs to be done. You just go and do it. Um, if the, you think there might be some logistical issues, 
ask, um, you know, for some clarification because you don't want to, you know, put like, you know, the the fire pit where someone's going to walk into it or it's going to block the parade ground. Um, but yeah, if, if or we're low, like a modern thing, it's where like emergency response vehicles have to get through, like an ambulance. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then so yeah, whenever there's you know, if we're low on wood, go get more wood. Uh, does it need to be split? Do you need kindling? Do you need water? Um, did someone's tent fall over when they're not there? Um, really, kind of take an opportunity to step up every chance you can um, because it's going to make everyone's life easier. And that's the great thing about studying leadership and integrating leadership principles into your unit is because that the more everyone knows what's expected of them and the values that you all share. When everyone does their part, there is a lot more downtime to relax during an event. Um, it's it's kind of chaotic and hectic and tiring if only a couple of people are doing all the work. Um, and for those of you in command, that also means that you need to delegate and, and release that control um, with your enlisted and junior NCOs. Yeah. Yeah. Initiative is one of those hard things for people to learn because, like, one, they don't want to see too eager. Yeah. I've noticed it's just like, no, like, yeah, go do it. Like, please. It takes a load off my mind that I know I'm getting it or that I know it's getting done. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, people don't want to overstep boundaries. Yeah. You know, like, hey, like, I don't want to piss this guy off or, you know, I don't want to piss the corporal off. It's like, no, trust me, you're doing your NCOs a favor. <laughs> they love that. Yes. Um, next one. Integrity. Integrity. Uprightness of character and soundness of moral principles includes the qualities of truthfulness and honesty. So with integrity, own up to your mistakes. I mean, I know First Heart has heard me many times like, yep, that's my bad. <laughs> yep. You know, it's one of those things, you know, yeah, maybe the mistakes are embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It happens. But when people see that and hear the, hey, that was my bad, or hey, you know, well, I'll do better next time. It's one of those things that really go a long way. It's like, okay, he's human. We make mistakes, and he will work to do better. I mean, that's from, you know, the lowest to the highest, and that's even in just modern, like, workplace mentality. Um, but it also goes into, you know, don't cheat people out of what they're due, you know? Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, like, oh, no, I did it all. It's like, no, we Yeah, did that's it all. A, that flip side. That's key. Yeah, I mean, I hear it all the time at officer's call. It's like, you know, oh, yeah, you know, Captain Whitehall, you know, you did great out there. It's like, no, my company did great out there. Yeah. You know, you That's because we carry him. <laughs> that, that chair gets awful heavy after a while, doesn't it? <laughs> He's our Caesar. Um, but, you know, also, I guess, you know, like, with if you have a company fund. Yeah. Keep your integrity. Don't buy stuff for yourself. Buy stuff for your company. Um. Someone gives you, I don't know, like... Well, it's about... Again, integrity is one of those things that covers so many things. <laughs> yeah. I'm the hard ones. You're doing the easy ones. Yeah, it, well, it's about being honest um, and true to your word. Um, it can be it can be tough, but, like, yeah. I, I don't commit to anything um, that I can't give 100% to. Um, yeah. And so saying no, I think, is an important part of maintaining your integrity. Um, because you should be able to say no to things you don't believe in, um, or things that you think are unfair, or, you know, an order, or an organizational thing that's happening in an event that you don't agree with. Um, but I also think, too, uh, with integrity, it's kind of like the old saying, like, you know, why did the person get in trouble? It's not because he did something wrong, it's because he lied about it. Um, so, yeah, just be be true to your word, and and have that word... And that and that that character means something to the people around you. You should be a rock um, to your unit. So we did integrity, uh, judgment, uh, the ability to weigh facts and possible solutions on which to base sound decisions. So I'll do this one. We can answer, catch up on some comments. Um, yeah, judgment. I think for reenacting, a lot of it's going to be common sense. Yeah. Uh, more than anything, and common sense and experience kind of go hand in hand. Uh, but judgment is also aided by being properly prepared. Um, but judgment on the reenacting battlefield, though. That's um, a hard one. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it's really important to understand your units uh, on yeah. both sides, especially when you're going to head-to-head. -to -head. Yeah. Um, 
we know we know units and reenactors that have varying le le levels of reputation when it comes to safety yep. and playing by the rules. Um, and so if you find yourself on that section of a battlefield, you have to be able to make judgment calls as to whether or not you're going to engage knowing that they could be doing something stupid yeah. uh, or dangerous, uh, worst case. Um, and then also having the judgment to take initiative. Um, we rarely... Uh, we're we're aggressive as a unit, but we're not super aggressive. It's yeah. just everyone else is just like, you know, baby step, baby step, burn powder, burn powder, burn powder, baby step, baby step, burn powder, burn powder. Oh, everyone's in the safety zone because the battlefield's a hundred square feet. What do we do? <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it it's a pain. So uh, judgment is going to be played on the battlefield with making decisions about how how to best use your unit, um, and we're big advocates. Military manuals talked about platoons and squads, and if you never deploy your units as those, you are not using your best judgment tactically to get the most advantage out of your unit. Uh, but being able to do that requires leadership. And in a way, that kind of plays into, you know, like officers carrying pistols and firing. It's like you have a company as your <laughs> weapon. Yeah, everyone gets so hot about like, oh, I can't wait till I get a pistol. It's like, why? You should, I mean... <laughs> In the war, if you're within range, I mean, you're looking max 20 yards in combat during the Civil War with a pistol, right? If you're drawing your pistol, you're like 50-50 going to die. Yeah. Like, it is last ditch. Uh, so if you're on a regular battlefield, it's... I mean, it's should, dead weight. Should I say the real term for if you have to draw a pistol in real combat situation? Hmm. You done fucked up. <laughs> if you're a company <laughs> officer and you're <laughs> using a pistol... At close range, I already said it. I'm not going to say well, it. Well, no, yeah, I, I guess that that makes sense too. I mean, if you're a company commander, and you're always drawing your pistol. Like, you why? Know, you, we're going to look at you as like, what's wrong with your company? Can we just like charge you and take you now? Um, <laughs> Maybe four times have I ever had to draw a pistol on the field. I think those were all like scenario based. Yep. Or you were working with another reenactor on purpose. Yep. Um, and it was usually really cool. I think one time you did it like you were working with some kids. Like you had some like youngins in a unit that you'd worked with. Yeah. You had some pretty active yeah. like uh, little ones. So when they take the field, we try to have a good show for them. And Ethan's always been great with like the young reenactors. I try. I try. Okay. Comments. Um, yeah. Then we'll move on to the last one, two, three, four, five. Now, uh, there was one uh, about hand to hand. Um, we're getting close. Like again, like there's, there's not a whole. I mean, I could. There's only a. We can name the reenactors on both sides that we would be comfortable doing that with. Yeah. A lot, a lot are pretty sketchy. And then there's going to be plenty that are hungover. People who just, you know, kind of miss the whole safe word, this is a show sort of thing. Pineapple juice. That's the safe word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and so and a lot of that comes with practice. Um, our organization doesn't really like to try anything new. I, I think they're, they always air on the side of super caution. Yeah. Um, and so that's when we get baby step, baby step, burn powder, burn powder, baby step, baby step, burn powder. Yeah. Um, so, but hand to hand, I mean, they're also like, oh, the the, the, the public, you know, cheap community yeah. theater stuff, right? Um, they, they're like, oh, we have to put on this great show for the public. It's like, well, doing it the way you do is boring, not historically accurate. You need to be creating scenarios and training those scenarios if you're all freaked out about safety, Practice, practice, practice. Have have a safety course. Have have more than like one five minute practice between a group if they're going to do hand to hand. Yeah. Like this is this can be done. It happens in movies all the time. So this is you're not reinventing the wheel. So you can you can do those things, but you need to, I think ideally have just a general good relationship with the other company you're going to engage with. I think company to company you should be pretty socially comfortable. Like, spend good quality time with each other. The first time you meet shouldn't be when you're, you know, playing hand-to-hand. -hand. That's that's just dangerous. Yeah, I mean, 30 minutes of practice is worth more than a broken jaw. Yes, so. yes. Um, there was one, another one about food at events. Um, I eat modern. Um, and then, uh, mostly because, uh, well, it's just nice. And... Uh, it makes for a happy first sergeant um, because uh, you don't want a grumpy first sergeant. And then when we when we like bivouac and stuff like that, I'm uh, 
modern military ration. I'm a big fan of the French RCIR. Um, so I'll I'll field strip an RCIR and then pack it in my haversack. And then sometimes I br I'll break it down into period poke sacks too. So I blend in um, even more that way. Uh, but we we do uh, we are getting much more into period food, period cooking, um, and and so that's uh, that's really nice. Yeah, I kind of do the almost exact opposite to an extreme. I barely eat at events. Mm -hmm. Granted, I also don't have any time to really cook a meal for myself, period, or modern. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of go the You're fresh nib course starvation diet. Well, nibbler tend to have a heavy dinner. Yeah, that's true. I only, personal fact, I only eat one big meal a day normally, so that usually carries me through the rest. So I'll just gorge myself like three days before an event, and I'm usually okay. Except that drive home, I will crush like three <laughs> foot long Subway sandwiches. Like just boom, 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 and everyone's just... <laughs> Did you chew? Yeah. I mean, I just Scooby-Doo it and just... <laughs> um, Video games. That was another question. Yeah, uh, a couple more things on food. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, just like be thoughtful about it. We're we're not sticklers for um, food, but if you bring food, um, you need to be able to feed yourself, like yep. like a big boy or a big girl, um, and do your best to conceal it. Uh, yeah. that's really key. Um, and then um, if if and also too because you may have like like dietary or medical needs that go along with that yeah. that meal plan. So you need, you know, be creative. Like you can package it in period wrapping, um, and then there should be plenty of people in your unit. And that we've getting more and more experience um, with cooking on the fire. So you could take your modern food and prepare it in a traditional way. Um, worst case scenario, just you know, cold cuts and yeah. hardtack. I mean, that'll get you a long way too. Okay, uh, games. Um, I live in the country, so that's why we. I'm. This is my first time on a live stream. Um, I mean, you also live like 300 plus miles away from me. <laughs> well, yeah, but like I live in the country, so I have country internet, which, you know, a, a pigeon is faster than my, my internet. So I mean, you were talking about your video quality on YouTube before uh, we started this. Oh, thing. yeah, like to like stream, like uh, like a steady stream on YouTube at home. I, I have my resolution like 240p. So it's, uh, you know, I'm rocking that like, yeah, and then okay. we're watching, we're, yeah, we're watching like HD here. It's like, it's like I'm watching 3D. It's crazy. Uh, but, uh, Ethan and a bunch of other people in the unit play, uh, video games. Yeah. I mean, I play a little, try to play a little bit of everything. I've played, uh, War of Rights. I saw that as a question. I heard it's gotten better. I heard, you know, when I first played, it was pretty just, I, it was not my thing. Pe you know, too many people kind of power hungry wanting rank and just kind of a toxic community in a way but I mean I will play the hell out of like Rainbow Six Siege, uh, DayZ, The Forest, you know just some other weird little off ones, uh, strategy games like Total War, things like that. It's my jam. That's why I built like a hybrid computer for gaming, streaming, and making videos <laughs> and homework. <laughs> that's, that's like the last one even though it's the most important one since I'm in school. It's like you it should be doing homework, you know. Yeah, I, I think I have, like, the internet capacity for, like, original Duke Nukem 3D where I'm at, so. <laughs> um, I'll wire you a fiber optic cable from here for you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Drawers. Oh, yeah. Cause this, I, I saw that one. I was like, all right, because he and I are so opposite with the drawers, so I'll, I'll have you go first. Do you, oh. wear, do you wear drawers at events? Well, I, I'm not, like, you know, free. But like I don't wear I don't wear period uh, underwear. Uh, I have no problem with wool, um, but we have some stuff coming up this this year that I'll break down and buy some dumb drawers. But we also don't panty check. I just think that's weird. Whoever you are, because like that's not something that should be visible. And if it is, what kind of stuff are you doing in your unit? Just <laughs> just saying, like your drawer should be your business, you know. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, so, but everyone else wears drawers. Yeah, I do. Um, I don't actually have the dominant flannel ones, like the really nice, super soft on the inside, mm -hmm. thick on the outside. I just have, like, the civilian. Well, they had a summer and winter drawers. one, didn't they? Kind of, yeah. Kinda. I mean, technically, you're supposed to wear, like, the federal issue drawers year-round, even if it's hot as balls, because 
Pun in, heavily intended on that, by the way. S sweating is was considered healthy for you. Yeah, and you know what? Wicks the sweat. Mm -hmm. You'll find out eventually. You know, oh, it, I, it might I, change you. I, I, yeah, I have no problem sweating. So. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for me, yeah, I wear drawers pretty much all the time. I don't have a problem with wool, especially Hainsworth, because it's super fine. But I mean, there's been times, like, I forget my drawers, or I only have one pair, and they got pretty sweaty the day before. I'll, uh, I'll go commando. <laughs> it, it's weird. It's having some wool scratching up on some places that's never had. But again, no one that. should ever know what's going on down there. That's my point. That's one of those things, you know, like, I don't... I don't, you don't, I don't, you don't care about the 100% wellness of our sharpshooters? Yeah, sharp. yeah, no, no. I am woeful in my violation of regulations. No, that's why we got corporates. <laughs> <laughs> they check that, we don't. Oh, that's, yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. I think we're caught up. Oh, David asked another good question. Are you seeing an uptick in people cooking period correct with the popularity of James Townsend and Son's channel? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's because they make it more uh, broken down to where, you know, you think, oh God, all this period correct uh, cooking takes all this time and it's, you know, this and that. It's not, it's super easy. Most of the stuff, isn't you know super perishable you can keep it for a day or two unrefrigerated mm. and it tastes good so yeah i would say honestly for all the the food people this is this is a challenge to like other civil war reenactor channels um i know townsend's townsend's has probably done the most addressing this topic but like do some real science about perishability because here's the thing. The authentics are like, oh, I, I, I've been eating this crap out of my haversack, and you know, I never get sick. It's like, well, I don't know. It seems like half the time we see, like, campaigner units, like, run off because they all eat bad peaches. Um, <laughs> that if, has happened here in Washington. Yeah, like, the, if, the people most likely to get food poisoning are the authentic people. But they're trying, so I'm not going to... Yeah, my hat's off to them. For I, I'm going to laugh, but, you know, not openly about Experience it. Experience the Civil War and all of its glory, dysentery <laughs> included. Well, and see, that's just the thing. Like, you know, these people say, oh, it's fine, I did it once, and you'll be fine, too. It's like, no, like, diarrhea was a rampant issue on both sides of the Civil War. Tens and tens of thousands of people died from diarrhea-related illnesses yep. alone. Yep. And then Company D, we had people down for long stretches. Wyman White had, was plagued by intestinal issues during the course of the war. Yep. The food and the water were bad, and it wreaked havoc on your bowels. Yeah. So if you want to be like painting the rocks with your butt at an event <laughs> to be authentic, <laughs> go for it. But in the, <laughs> in the spirit of things, I would definitely say if you if you're into period food, do so, do some like legit experiments. Like uh, talk about food. Um, you know, what's its preservation? <laughs> I think I broke the captain. Um, I'm how, just getting bad into this separation right now. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> I was like, the sinks it's, are that way. It's coming out like lava. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so, but oh like, God. uh, there are a lot, so I believe in like pre-cooked foods, they had pre-packaged foods, um, you know, one thing that gets me is like, uh, authentics are like, oh, they only had like, you know, hard tack and bacon. It's like, well, like, they forged a lot. They forged a ton, like. Or they had food sent home. And Matthews, in his diaries, ate all kinds of stuff. Like after, I think it was sometime after Chancellorsville, he built an oven and baked a custard in camp you know how anyone bake custards aren't like beginner level and then you're trying to bake a custard in a field made oven and you made it work yeah i was actually talking with brian and dan about it and uh Severson mentioned it they're like yeah actually believe it or not townsend's custard recipe is very similar to probably how matthews did it and it's super simple because they've done it in the field See? So there is there's a lot more diversity and again diaries are going to help you with figuring all that stuff out and then and do the research with your unit's history. Yeah. So one of the things that the Berdans learned early on was to eat a lot of stew. And they learned that from the Germans and the Prussians, right? Yeah, from Company A of the First U.S. Yeah. They mostly boiled their food or they made a lot of soups and stews. And they were 
predominantly healthier than the rest of the American born because frying at the time was super popular. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, it still is. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah. McDonald's exists for a reason. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think a lot of it too, especially because, you know, we're used to eating a lot better quality food, but at the same time, we're not used to eating salt pork, raw vegetables almost. And that, I'm glad you brought that up. I always you, forget you that. You kind of need to train your gut yes. bacteria to really do it. You know, you Your whole to, body. Yeah, and you can't do that a week before an event. You have to do that months before because that bacteria has to grow and kind of do its thing in your stomach. Even though, yeah, like people think bacteria is a bad thing. There's good bacteria out there. A lot of it resides in your gut. Well, and also, too, it's like if you're, you know, whatever normal modern diet you're used to, switching to a minimal high-fat, high-carb diet yeah. um, is going to shock your system. So oh, yeah, it you, wrecks your gut yeah. super quick. Well, and just like, so you're going to have like your energy issues, yep. um, you know, your blood sugar could be all wonky, you could be cranky, um, and you may be at sub-physical performance. So it's, don't don't go cold turkey, reverse cold turkey into like rations. Yeah. Uh, practice, experiment at home, add some meals in. Uh, you'll have a much better time. And I think the more we can all practice cooking um, old-timey recipes, uh, work for the better. Yeah. Um, oh, God, yeah. God, what was the other one? I was about to piggyback off that. Um, train your body. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why can I remember this now? It was a really good point, too. Okay. Oh, well. It'll come to me, and I'll be like, yeah. oh, 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 by the way, um, 20 minutes from now. So before we go back to the list, uh, we we got we have a great, another great great question. How do you bring in new blood? Do you attend county fairs, gun shows, etc.? cetera? Um, so the big thing that I think we decided to do was to do the whole YouTube thing and yeah. then really put, like, a lot of time and effort into um, our web presence. Yep. And, and, and that's really, I, I feel like, I, I know I've noticed, and I'm very positive and happy that even the authentics have gone the camera route. Yeah, they're, they're they're even if it's amateur or it's professional, the authentics are making conscious, calculated, and minimally invasive decisions to photograph what they do. Because you can't get excited about going authentic if you've never seen it, right? Yeah. What's it like? What's it look like? Felt? Feel like? Um, smell like? Um, and so I feel like that's, I feel like to grow the hobby and to keep recruiting, a lot of it is about getting your unit out there, um, on social media, because you never know who's going to show up for the public. Um, they may or may not have reliable transportation. Not most people are, um, surprised that we travel so much as reenactors. Um, so it's not like it's a routine thing that we'll, you know, we'll be back uh, next month. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that way. We're going to be across the state next month. Um, <laughs> So I feel like social media is a, is a big way of doing it. Um, you know, we post a few things on our public Facebook page. We've actually gained recruits through our YouTube channel. Yeah, that that is absolutely true. Um, and then we have a, a private um, Facebook page for our unit too. And so a lot of it is about maintaining that excitement and that enthusiasm uh, for your existing unit. And then the more pumped your unit is about what they do and who they represent. The, that is just going to just engage more people uh, around them. And so taking all those possibilities and having a good time and letting the people see wh- who you are and what you do, I think are the two main things with, with helping with recruiting. Um, but we, we haven't done that. We do know some units that, that do like antique fairs and county stuff. Gun um, shows. Gun shows. But we haven't, we haven't done that. We're not against it, but just kind of. It's not a thing. Yeah. And we're our unit is scattered across Washington, three states: yeah. Washington, so, Idaho, Montana, Montana. We got Oregon. a Canadian for a while. Oregon, yeah. Uh, do we have anyone in Oregon? Still? No, we used to. We used to. I mean, Colt's close enough to Oregon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, yeah, we're writing questions down as we're doing this. We'll yeah. get to them after our list. Uh, so you did judgment. Yeah. All right. So, Justice. This is actually <laughs> one of my favorite ones. I love it. So, Justice. Giving reward and punishment according to merits of the case in question. The ability to administer a system of rewards and punishments impartially and consistently. So, a lot of that, I'm going to start off. Don't play favorites. See everyone 
as equally useful. I'm not going to say worthless. <laughs> That's good, too. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, if you want to pull the uh, the Full Metal Jacket or Lee Ermey, you know, you're all equally worthless. You know, there's no race or you yeah. know, anything here. But no, see everyone as an equal, you know. And then from there, you judge them. You know, if someone did great, hey, you know, great job out there on the field. Or, hey, great job leading uh, that detail, you know, taking that detail, showing that initiative and not being asked to do that detail. Um, there we go. Uh, you know, give the rewards. But then also there's the justice of someone goofed up. You know, the punishment should fit uh, the crime, so to speak. Someone, you know, forgets their canteen before we go out on a detail, or someone leaves their rifle out. That's a real common one that we've seen at events. We're really anal about leaving rifles out. Um, we are riflemen. Yeah. <laughs> we live and breathe by our rifles. Um, but, you know, you'll see guys who leave their rifle out, and that rifle will go missing for a couple hours. Or anything. Or anything. Um, Dropping but, your crap in the street like it's company property. Yeah. Until you realize it's gone, and then you got to figure out who, where it went. Yeah, but I also think justice comes a lot into conflict resolution within your company because <clears throat> we're all human. You know, someone gets a little cranky. You know, they kind of chew out someone for no reason, or people just have a disagreeing. Yeah, and it tone happens. I think is a big thing. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of goes under. Someone tact, just but... says something in the wrong tone. Yeah, and that goes under tact. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that, but you know, conflict resolution, especially as you know, the captain and first sergeant, we kind of need to break that you know boundary. Say like a corporal and a private are kind of butting heads. You know, we hit like, hey, all right, you two come over here. You know, what's the problem? Okay, okay, yeah, I heard your side, heard your side. <laughs> And you know where the captain's knee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and basically try to find that middle ground to where you can solve that problem, everyone's happy, kiss and make up, and then carry on with the fun. Yeah, I kind of feel like where that description of us as mom and dad is kind of apt. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's just about, yeah, it's not like no one's ever done anything where you get to like, ah! Yeah, there's, it's, um, no one's thrown fists in the company. We've just had, you know, some, like, Storming off. I've done it in my head a lot of times, but... <laughs> I mean, yeah. I love everyone in our unit, but there are sometimes they make me want to choke them out with a cordless phone. <coughs> um, but I would, I would say definitely when it comes to this area is... Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, fair, um, fair doesn't mean equal. Um, and that's a really important thing yeah. to consider when it comes to the way that you have to like address conflict resolution or, or screw-ups or you know, teachable moments yep. is, um, you know, someone who does something who's like a three-year vet um, is probably going to be having a different conversation than someone on their second event. Yeah, or even first event. Yeah. Like someone's just out of line or, you know, someone fired from the rear rank of a skirmish line. Yeah. It's like, hey, you know, next time make sure you're actually forward or online with everyone. No problem after that. As well as someone who's, you know, like, if this guy does it, they're like, can you pull your head out of your ass for like five <laughs> seconds before you do that again, please? Yeah, it's uh, um, yeah, it's just about you know taking stock of, the, of of the situation in hand and having a good, positive, mm -hmm. non-confrontational con you know, conversation about the issue. Yeah, or like with our company, company drill is a must <clears throat> unless you're excused for if you're sick. Or, yeah, or you're in detail or something. Yeah, like or if battalion has a leash around your neck and they're, nope, nope, we need you, we need you. Not just because you don't want to. Yeah, but if someone doesn't want to, that's fine, cool. But guess what? You're not going out on the field. Yeah. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is like a no, uh, no excuse infraction in our company. And again, that's the justice of it. And that's written down. Yeah. So I think the justice thing, like, don't surprise people. And you can't, yeah. you can't like, make up the rules as you go. I mean, so, I can. Well, yeah, you're the captain. You can do whatever you want. But um, I don't. But, but we, we have uh, on our website our Company D standing orders. And it's just sort of like a like a group covenant about, hey, you know, this is how we treat our camp. And this is our general schedule. This is what's expected. It's, it's not so much, you know, my way or the highway. It's like, just so you know, these are accountability points. Um, so you can come prepared and know what's expected of you. Yeah. 
<clears throat> um, your next one would be knowledge. The understanding of a science or art, the range of one's information, including professional knowledge and understanding, this says of your Marines, but really yeah. of those under you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Learn. Like, just be... Uh, actually, there's something in here in the Marine Corps evaluation form under in, uh, in Intellect and Wisdom, Section G. Um so the overall definition is commitment to intellectual growth in ways beneficial to the Marine Corps, uh, increases the breadth and depth of war fighting and leadership aptitude. Uh, resources include, you know, uh, further professional development, uh, certification process, going over, you know, above and beyond um, in your education in all aspects. Um, and then uh, for like the top mark, it would be you are dedicated to lifelong learning as, as a result of active and continuous efforts, widely recognized as an intellectual leader in professionally related topics, makes time for study and takes advantage of all resources and programs, introduces new and creative approaches to service services issues, engages in a broad spectrum of forums and dialogues. And I think once again, the, the core like nailed it um, on the head. It's it's about um, being a knowledgeable reenactor doesn't just mean you know how reenactment works. Um, so you you should be curious in all aspects of your unit's history, the experiences history, uh, civilian life, uh, the personal life of your soldiers. Um, always always be trying to find out more, um, and it could be learning about like. You know, maybe you're a, a male soldier and you pursue more information about um, women of the time and the social issues affecting them. Maybe you're studying and looking up period newspapers. Uh, maybe you're trying to learn about drill. Maybe you're going to authentic events to learn certain things, to learn more about history or because you know that this company commander is renowned for their knowledge and drill and you can learn under those experts. Um, you know, if you're at an event and there's a reenactor that you know of and you, res and you respect, you know, send a courier with a, with a letter asking to, to visit camp or come in and do military courtesy and, and schedule a time to sit down and interact with those people. Uh, you don't have to be isolated and, and huddled in your A-tent um, the whole weekend and just, you know, drinking the night away. Um, yeah. pur pursue... Pursue your best knowledge that you can. Always be curious. And then what's great is, um, let's see, where does it say it? Uh, I think it, oh, yeah. Uh, well, it, it says it's about, like, sharing sharing your knowledge. So um, don't hoard. Um, I think you notice in our unit. Um, we share everything. Yeah, we're all That's about the uh, democratization of information. And so all this stuff. You know, one thing that drives me nuts about, you know, forums is you'll get someone with this really thought out um, and, like, useful, like, quality question on a forum. And the sometimes, the, like, all they'll get back are links. It's like, that. that is, that's, in my opinion, that's worse than helping. Because, yeah. you know, it's like, the only thing that tells me is someone watching this conversation is that maybe, maybe you have a pretty awesome bookmark list. Um, but it doesn't show, it, does, it shouldn't convince anyone that they know anything about what that link has to say. doesn't mean they can explain it or demonstrate it for that matter. So um, if you know something, show it. And when you learn something, you kind of have a responsibility to pass that knowledge on to other people around you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to expand on the knowledge, too, because coming from the company commander standpoint, um, so from the private on down, or from the private on up, Know your weapon system. Yeah. If you're a captain, know yeah. your company. Know the strengths and weaknesses. Hey, we're great at skirmish but we suck at line tactics. Mm -hmm. Or we're, you know, we need to work on this or that. But also know your platoons. Like, hey, first platoon's really good. All the fast movers are in it. They know their stuff. Second platoon's a little weaker. Maybe it's full of the, the kids, the new ones. Don't put them in bad situations. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, that goes down every rank as... Well, yeah, it's knowledge of your of your of your NCOs and yeah. your junior officers. Yeah, know their strengths. Um, and if you're a private, know your sharps. 
or know your musket, anything, whatever. Arguably, you should, you should know nothing in this world better than your sharp yeah, rifle. Know, <laughs> know what your primary weapon. How about yeah, that? Yeah. Know your primary weapon. Hey, my caps are only busting caps. Okay, well, is it a clogged flash channel? Is my round too far up? Are my caps weak? Or, you know, uh, a- anything, really. Yeah, you, you, you could have something wrong with your trigger system. The hammer could be loose. Um, there's all sorts of things. So. Yeah, it's just one of those weird things. But, yeah, to know, know everything possible, I well, guess, is the best way to put it. Well, that, go, that goes to uh, technical and tactical proficiency. Yeah. So, <clears throat> knowledge, knowledge of um, your weapon system, your gear... Um, you'd be surprised, like, the, the, is, the uniform soldiers were issued were done so deliberately, and believe it or not, after years of research and development. So there's a reason that those soldiers wore and carried those items, and they knew how to use those systems. So can you use them effectively and proficiently as they could? So, I mean, just like modern military. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Next one. Ooh, I like this one too. Tact. The ability to deal with others without creating offense. <sighs> Basically, the best way to sum it up... The most trying of all these values. Patience. <laughs> yeah. Patience and tact go hand in hand. Yeah. Instead of getting into someone's face and just... Rah, 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 you screwed up! Rah, 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 rah. Lord, give me strength. It's... The best way is... A sandwich. You put a nice layer that is the bread of, hey, you did really well. Fill that center with, but you kind of messed up on this. And then finish it off with, but I know if you work out it, you'll be perfect. Let's do this together to get you going. That's the best way I do it because I talk about that at work all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But tact is knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Yes. Instead of saying, you know, right then and there, you know, someone screwed up, just chewing them out in front of everyone. It's, you know, like. Hey, for a sergeant, let's go for a walk. Let, let's have a little talk real quick. And then, during that talk... It's like, why do you have a bat in a bag? <laughs> <laughs> why is there a tube sock filled with soap? <laughs> you know, it's... It's one of those things of, you know, kindness goes way further than meanness and aggressiveness. Yeah, what you say and how you say it and the posturing that you have when you say it matters. Yeah, yeah it's and, just one of those things of being self-aware. Yeah, knowing when to keep your mouth shut, I think, is also a big one. Yeah. There, yeah, there's there's a few famous people I would say in our organization that are light in the tact area. <laughs> yeah, we, we have plenty of laughs, and it's that. definitely one of those things I've even had to learn myself, <laughs> and it still kind of slips up here and there. But it's usually more comical when it does slip because I say outlandish things. Yeah, well, and I think the important thing about talking about stuff like this isn't so much to say like, oh, in order to be a good person or a good reenactor, you need to be perfect and all these. Like, oh, no. no. It, it's about, like, these are some good guides to, like, help help realign you or help, like, refresh your memory. Because any one of the, these, these all flex, especially depending on, like, how tired or how hot or how hungry we are. And it's just important. Or frustrated. Yeah, yeah <laughs> frustrated. And you just, like, remember, like, okay, what are these values? Take a deep breath. And... Woosa. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Unselfishness. Uh, avoidance of providing... For one's own comfort and personal advancement at the expense of others. Oh, yeah. Uh, Don't be a blue falcon. <laughs> what? Funny fucker. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry if there's kids. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, our, our leadership philosophy is that of service. Um, yep. We're service-minded leaders, um, and we have no problem picking up a shovel um, or getting sweaty uh, with the newest enlisted. Best way to sum it up: the needs of the many outweigh the wants of the few. Yeah, and uh, but that, and I think in, in common practice, it's about um, you know helping carpool. Um, yeah. You know, ta- how, you know, loaning people gear that you can spare or spare ammo. Or you know, taking a you know, even sharing your time. I think for me, that's a big one. I, yeah. I'm, um, and, and so like taking that time to like. Show someone how to make a fire or, you know, how to cook a tricky burger over a, um, a campfire. Yeah. Um, it's Or let alone sharing food. Mm-hmm. You notice someone forgot something, you're like, okay, wow, I'm probably not going to eat. Like, hey, here's mm-hmm. some of my food. Not what's left over, but genuinely like a full plate of food. Like, grab yourself a fork, 
Let's get over here. Let's dig in. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Food, I mean, it's a, always a common complaint with soldiers, even from the Civil War. Terrible food or lack of food creates, you know, discontent. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes a with... full private's a happy private. Yes. And I feel like that, that goes also to what you talked about earlier about praise, is being generous in praise. Yeah. Um, and, and your appreciation uh, of other people. Uh, I think is is really important, um, and then unselfishness is also too about knowledge. Um, yeah, don't uh, hide it. Yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like I feel like we're on the upswing. I think we're coming into a really fantastic new generation. But uh, there has been many many years of hoarding yeah. knowledge um, for like the for the select few, and I feel like we're kind of breaking down those barriers and getting that knowledge out and sharing that information with the larger reenacting community, uh, and it's becoming a better hobby uh, because of it yeah so yeah unselfishness is good in life and in reenacting absolutely uh oh yeah loyalty holy crap we're at the last one so loyalty again this is one of my favorites the quality of faithfulness to country the core the unit and one seniors subordinates and peers i mean that pretty much encompasses <clears throat> everything um again it's one of my favorites you know you you know, we're talking about unselfishness just before. Loyalty and unselfishness kind of play off each other, you know, for the greater good. I guess that's the way to put it. Instead of, you know... Well, oh, free decor. Yeah, yeah, you know, oh, well, I could just do this for myself, or I can do it for the unit. You know, it's like JFK, you know, not ask what you or your country can do for you, mm -hmm. ask what you can do for your country. It's just like that. I mean, it says, you know, country right there. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, be loyal to your unit. Be loyal to your squad, your platoon, your company. Yeah, your you battle know. buddy. Yeah, the guy next to you, front, right. I mean, soldiers today still talk about, soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen talk about, you know, yeah, we were, I wasn't afraid to die, but I was worried about letting the guy beside me die or letting him down, you mm -hmm. know, stuff like that. And like uh, First Sergeant said, it's esprit de corps. You know, you build that cohesion. You build that you know, ball of loyalty, you know, you'd have guys, you know, taking bullets for others and jumping on grenades, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously not in the Civil War, but, you know, you had guys staying with wounded comrades. Well, I'd probably jump on a grenade in the Civil War. I mean, they were marginally effective. I think there'd be a good chance. Like, <laughs> you got, you got um, about a 75% <laughs> chance of making it, you know. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I'll take that medal for the team. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you had original stories, or stories from the Civil War of comrades staying with someone who could not move, and they would both be captured, but it was that loyalty to his messmate or his file partner that they would not leave them behind, mm -hmm. that they would be cared for by one of their own and by, not by, you know, a Confederate or a Union soldier or hospital or mm -hmm. prison camp. I mean, guys sometimes in droves were captured together because one guy or two guys were wounded and they were not going to leave their friends behind. Yeah. And in reenacting, you know, it goes to the loyalty of, okay, I guess our turnout's not going to be great at that event. I'm going to drive. I'm going to get up at three in the morning. I'm yeah. going to drive through the night to show up at the last battle <laughs> on the last day. Yeah. You know, that that speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I, I think I, I think everyone would have a more uh, positive experience reenacting um, if we you did kind of focus more about on your battle buddy. Yeah. Um, because you know maybe they're hot and you can pour some canteen water down their neck. Uh, maybe they tripped and you take the time to to help them up and catch them back up. Maybe they're running. You know, maybe they ran out of caps. Yep. Um, you know, they they take a hit. You roll them over so they don't get sunburned in the face. I mean, uh, I enjoy that, but yeah, I'm weird. Yeah, uh, you're you're out there like lotioning it up in the middle of battle. <laughs> get, get that tan right. <laughs> got, 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 got my little, little bed goggles on. <laughs> just out there, just rocking a banana hammock on the field. <laughs> How did the captain get naked so quickly? <laughs> don't mind him. He's actually know. dead. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think I think that that loyalty aspect. Um, it is a good one, um, but also too ha being loyal. If you are in command, being loyal to your your enlisted, yeah, or your junior NCOs and officers. Um, Don't leave them out to dry. Yeah, I mean, there is one that will always stick with me. Is um, several years ago we we had just this nasty safety violation on on our flank, 
and someone tried to take one of our soldiers' um, rifles, rifles hands-on, uh, firing in the safety zone, trying to physically remove his rifle from his hand. Um, and he was calling in front of people who should have done something, the safety violation. Um, and then afterwards, um, Ethan and I get called to battalion and we're reprimanded because he used the F word and people could have heard that. It's like, well, as the safety people were standing there watching it, not doing anything, he was standing up for his entire platoon and not breaking that safety line. He was not going to leave them, and he was not going to sacrifice the the written in stone safety rules that we take tests on every year. He was going to lead by that example and hold firm. And afterwards, it's like you're fine. It's like we we just don't like we don't we don't care what you think. We know you have to pull us over here and say you had a talk, but no. We our our man did absolutely nothing yep. wrong, standing up for his safety and the safety uh, of his platoon. So that I mean he had, he showed loyalty to his to his soldiers, and we will always show our loyalty to ours. So. Well, I mean this last season at uh, Chehalis, <sighs> there's the that rifle incident that was uh, pointed. Oh yeah, at the, oddly enough, the same guy that had the rifle almost you know grabbed out of his hands and. I mean, that was handled pretty swelly as well by him, too. He's just like, is that a loaded rifle? <laughs> it's like, that's... and I, as soon as I saw that, too, right. I, mean, I was already on my way over there, and I saw that. I was like, Phew. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's the thing that sometimes we take for granted, is that, you know, we, they're, you know, they're real guns that fire powder, but they can still be very dangerous in close range. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, safety is an ongoing concern that we're all responsible for. Be loyal to the safety guidelines, damn it. <laughs> yeah, and that loyalty means you're always looking out for each other yes. um, in those situations, too. And some people will be like, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. It's like, well, you're an idiot, and you are, so. Yeah, I mean, I've had to kind of break tact at times, and I've had to do that call people an idiot or arrogant or ignorant and they don't like it yeah but you notice the next time they're out they're more cautious <laughs> than the people who are like safe you know the, uh, the safety nannies yeah you know they'll call it a, a you know a ceasefire for a beasting or something like that oh yeah it's like, yeah it's... but they learned yeah yeah um... a little anecdote Let's see. Uh, okay, so we're at a good kind of pause area as we kind of wrap up. So if you have questions, go ahead and uh, blast them our way. There's see, there's one that I saw. On the topic of new blood, how big do you think your unit of sharpshooters could be? Would you want to limit your size? Or uh, if things go well, um, or we're well organized, the more the merrier? I would love to field a... Battalion. Yeah. I'm a, <laughs> okay, let's not get too extreme, but 30 sharpshooters. <laughs> we just show up with 10 companies. Yeah. I have would, a whole, at least a regiment. I would love to have 30 sharpshooters just for the fact we could have two groups of 15. Like, we cause trouble with 15, with 12, 8 even. But 15 sharpshooters who know what they're doing on either flank. I mean, that's, this terrifies him because he knows he would move from here to here. <laughs> but I'm sure that day will be inevitable. But 30 short, my, my ideal number is 30. Will we ever get there? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But I would, the more the merrier. Yeah. I mean, we have the protocols in place and the people in line that could fill those leadership positions. Yeah. To where we could effectively field 30 people. Now we start getting upwards of a hundred. <laughs> It'll never happen with that much, but well, and and I, we could grow. We're 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 a quality over quantity unit. Um, we don't have open enrollment, um, and we do kind of have. I mean, it's a really low stakes vetting process, but you know, this is our family, and yep. we don't want any you know stranger coming in um, because we we have a reputation, we have a way of doing things, yeah, um, and we want to make sure that. Um, our family's in a good place and that anyone we bring in is going to be a great addition and have a wonderful time yeah. and it'll be a good fit for them too. 
Um, and it's not like we really hold an interview process. It's just a conversation. Yeah. From 10, 15 minutes of talking to a person, we're pretty good at gauging. I mean, there's been times we have people come to us at events that have eventually joined. And, you know, 10 minutes, you know, they'll, like, okay, cool. You know, we'll talk to you guys after the battle or something like that. We'll just look at each other and just, like, yeah, they're good. Or, like, maybe, yeah. Yeah. you know, we'll talk to them a little more. Because you can <clears throat> gauge, once you can kind of gauge people, mm-hmm. you'll know who's going to be that good fit, who's going to mesh well. Or, yeah. hey, you know, that unit over there, they're probably more your speed. You know, they're kind of more into what you're into. <clears throat> yeah. But, Shop around. Yeah. Um, let's see. Learned in basic training. Oh, Andrew, yes, I did get your package. I'm sorry. I've been really busy with work and school. But, yes, I got it. Thank you so much for those bullets. They're amazing. I can't wait to shoot them. I'm actually going to be going out shooting with my friends Sunday. So I'll let you know how they work. Um, but you learned in basic training about leaving stuff about. Uh, with weapons and drill sergeants could get the weapon away if it wasn't secured and the way you would find yourself in the front leaning rest yeah absolutely uh man had a good one um i was talking to a friend who mentioned sometimes he has been able to tag along with other units does it vary by region or has your unit had members participate in other events uh we bleed green so no most of our, <laughs> no, I just, I, most, just, most of our guys kind of stay within our unit yeah. We'll have some people from other units kind of try us out. Well, well, we just have people fall in. Like, so sometimes, like, you know, we've had people, like, no one in their company showed up. Yeah. Uh, about one time. Yeah. So we'll, we'll absorb them. Um, or, or, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll pick up people. Uh, we also just have, like, you know, we'll, we have, we've had people that carpool people from other units to events. Yep. I've done that. Um, a few times. So there, there's that, that sharing aspect of it, too. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anyone. I mean, we've had. Well, we I don't. Mean, we we have people that reenact other eras, if that kind of counts. Yeah, yeah. We don't really switch switch stuff um, ourselves, so we don't we don't switch. But we do. I mean, there are like some famous um, impression hoppers. Oh my god! Um, yeah. That you'll you'll see them in a completely different uniform, swapping sides, whatever. Multiple times a day. Multiple <laughs> times a day. Yeah. Um, and then um, at Cheney, um, McKnight was constantly changing his uniform, so I never had never knew if I was supposed to salute him or not. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, like, let me look you over. Oh, like, <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> I was like, oh, you're a private now. Okay, it's like you were a sergeant ten minutes ago. <laughs> I know. That was the quickest court martial ever. <laughs> Um, Do you guys have gear to join other mainline units if you don't get the numbers at an event? Uh, not well for the. I mean, we got blues now, for, almost for the most part, besides trousers. But we pretty much pull numbers at events now that we can be. Mm-hmm. I mean, even when our unit was tiny before <clears throat> the the great reforging, as I like mm-hmm. to call it now. I mean. Even with four people, they would still kind of cut us off to do our own thing. I, I guess it's kind of the beauty of being sharpshooters. Yeah, because we could have always just been like a detached Yeah, detached service. service. Yeah, which was super common. And it wasn't uncommon to find, even in battle, like sharpshooters scattered all over the wind Yeah. Um, during the event. Because sharpshooters during the war, and in McClure's own writing, was that each man was essentially his own army. Yep. Um, and expected to, to be able to to work on by himself or in a small group, whatever the situation allowed. And I think that was a pretty hardcore mentality for the war. Yeah, and it was unique because mm-hmm. you're thinking of Napoleonic tactics, strength in numbers, not self reliance. Yeah, in battle. Yeah. Um, Does anyone sing marching songs, marching cadences during drill, or oh yeah, all the time? We got some awesome mm-hmm. people in the company that find songs, sing songs. Some of them are modern. We don't sing them around the public. Yeah, know. some are just goofy to have fun, but we we do actively encourage um, singing. And we're um, uh, Corporal Soderling. Um, he's he's him and his wife have been in choir for forever. Yeah, and probably so, since the womb. Yeah, so they they can find like old lyrics and do the arrangements and stuff. And so he found out, and this is actually a fun thing. I'm sure everyone will get their minds blown away. Uh, Nirvana's cover of oh, yeah. Where Did You Sleep Last Night, performed originally by Lead Belly. He learned that from his grandpa. Who was a slave. Who was a slave during and before, or before and during the Civil War. 
So, Where Did You Sleep Last Night could technically be a Civil War era song in camp. Yeah, and so we, we, we have started to sing that every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> not, not in the style of Kurt Cobain. Yeah, yeah. We, I, we don't go in the tents and pull out the flannels and, you know. Heroin and all that fun <laughs> stuff, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, we also, play, we also play a lot of games. Yep. Um, Cribbage and Chuckaluck are really uh, popular with our unit. Um, and we have like... Uh, Wrestling. Yeah, wrestling's a big one. Uh, we got some fun pictures of that on our website too. Uh, when we try to do like a whole like betting thing, so it's like a like an event that happened in camp. Wrestling was uh, doc- documented quite often with sharpshooter units. Uh, let's see, topic of free time during camp before battles. How many people in your group or other groups bring instruments or play baseball? Pretty much the more progressive and hardcore units are the ones to do that. The the more mainstream units kind of just more lounge about the uh, company fly or just do i would say it's more structured yeah. with with those units um i feel like the the units that pack light and move quick um you'll find them singing any chance like calm you know yeah even a calm in between a battle you know like they'll they'll start singing you know in a small group or yeah um you know playing music. Uh, baseball so, doesn't happen that often. It's really popular. Um, it has to be, but it has to be organized. Yeah, and our organization is just a nightmare when it comes to laying out event sites. So good luck trying to find a spot with that. We had one event, you know, half the battlefield ended up being a campsite and that kind of... Yeah, put know, a they, camper on that. Yeah, we're lucky if we have a football field to fight on. Granted, I love the fact we were playing cards and betting and we get called up and we're like, people are stuffing money in pockets and like... <laughs> Trying to get it all cleaned up. It's just like, all right. Yeah. yeah David, you, thanks. You've been asking this fantastic question yeah. uh, all afternoon. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, well, we're kind of getting up there in time. So yeah. I, do... I got a place to take the first sergeant around here in town that he's going to... Yeah. I'll, I'll try and get some pictures for the website for him because kid in a candy store. Um, so I just want to go through um, this Marine Corps... Uh, evaluation sheet. Um, Jonko Wilnick, um, I'm not a military person, and so I just try to listen and learn from them as best I can. But I, I listen to the Jocko podcast every once in a while, and they did a good couple uh, episodes just on this alone. And um, it's pretty awesome uh, as far as kind of giving you an, an idea of places to go, or, you know, if, if, even if you're just looking at your at yourself as a reenactor. So we talked about intellect and intellect and wisdom. Uh, here's another one on decision making ability. Um, and like the highest category is that in decision making, that person is widely recognized and sought after to resolve the most critical, complex problems. Seldom matched analytical and intuitive abilities. Accurately foresees unexpected problems and arrives at well timed decisions despite fog and friction. Completely confident approach to all problems, masterfully strikes a balance between the desire for perfect knowledge and greater tempo. Absolutely amazing on that one. Judgment. Um, decisions reflect exceptional insight and wisdom beyond this Marine's experience. Counsel sought by all, often an arbiter. Consistent, superior judgment inspires the confidence of seniors. Uh, I think that is um, pretty amazing. Um, there's another one, a couple more under indi- under individual character. Um, effectiveness under stress, thinking, functioning, and leading effectively under conditions of physical and or mental, mental pressure. Uh, maintaining composure. I think it goes back to tact. Um, I like uh, this one in its highest category. Even the low side of this uh, criteria is impressive, uh, is an impressive goal. Um, but in the top one for effectiveness under stress, demonstrates seldom matched presence of mind under the most demanding circumstances. Stabilizes any situation through the resolute and timely application of direction, focus, and personal presence. Um, I know I've always liked initiative. It's I was kind of raised like you, we shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be asked to do something. You should just kind of intuit and be aware of your surroundings. Yep. Um, read read the needs of others. So for initiative, 
um, action in the presence of uh, specific direction. And the best category is highly motivated and proactive. Displays exceptional awareness of surroundings and environment, uncanny ability to anticipate mission requirements and quickly formulate original, far reaching solutions. Always takes decisive, effective actions. And yeah, um, and this one too, and I would say if you if you have rank of any sort, you know, you're a brand new corporal, um, being a role model is really key. Um, and so for setting the example, uh, the model Marine is that they are frequently emulated. That means that you are setting such a, such a good, consistent, high standard that people want, want to replicate that themselves. That's becoming internalized. Yeah. Um, exemplary conduct, behavior and actions are tone setting. So you are you are a, you're you're becoming a force in whatever unit you're a part of, Set and the pace. Yeah, an inspiration to subordinates, peers, and seniors. Remarkable dedication to improving self and others. So again, leadership and service. And lastly, I'll wrap up um, with ensuring the well-being of subordinates. So you leaders out there, noticeably enhances subordinates' well-being resulting in a measurable increase in unit effectiveness, maximizes unit and base resources to provide subordinates with the best support available. Proactive approach serves to energize unit members to take care of their own, thereby correcting potential problems before they can hinder subordinates' effectiveness. Widely recognized for techniques and policies that produce results and build morale. Build strong family atmosphere. Puts motto, mission first, Marines always into action. So um, I hope I hope those kind of tips have, you know, helped inspire you. Um, maybe uh, to help you pursue some more research or, you know, reflect on, on your leadership or questions you may have or conversations you may have in the future. Um, let's see. There's... Uh, we're just checking if there's any last minute burning questions. So we we got to get going. So any anything else that's burning, let us know. Um, I, I, we yeah we we hope you like this sort of topic of conversation. And um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah, Thanks everyone for taking the time to hang with us. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You guys have some awesome questions. I mean, you guys always do, but this one was really like. Someone just set off the smoke alarm upstairs. Okay. Well, what better excuse to, to wrap up. Thank you again, everyone. And we will see you next time. Be safe out there. Yep. Have a good one, you guys. And end stream right there.